Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. Oh, we're also on YouTube, but I'm not sure about the URL for that. It's not specific yet. But if you go to YouTube and search for Virtual Memories, you'll probably find me. Now, you can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week, you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod and patronize me. Now, our guest this week is Tom Gauld. Tom is a wonderful young cartoonist and illustrator. Um... You've probably seen his stuff in the, the New York Times or the New Yorker, um, as well as the, the Guardian's literary section where he does a regular literary um, gag panel or comic on their letters page. Um, you'll know him because Tom has this insanely distinctive style, um, and it's one that's very easy to mistake as simple. Uh, the people, well, the people are triangles uh, with little circular heads skinny limbs, virtually no facial expression, uh, or they're just silhouettes of the same thing. Um, but he conveys an awful lot in a seemingly simple style. And the literary jokes he tells, especially in that, that Guardian regular strip he does, um, that's just hysterical. Uh, Tom's got a, a new book out now, a full-length comic called Moon Cop from Drawn and Quarterly. Um, it's about a cop on the moon. It is quiet and meditative, and it doesn't bludgeon the reader with big, important themes, but but it's a really beautiful and lovely piece of work. Um, and again, that simplicity of Tom's style, the seeming simplicity, uh, really conveys an awful lot about the, the loneliness of this guy and, and what it means to come after all the, the excitement, I guess. We talk about it right at the beginning of the show, so I won't tell you any more about the book. I enjoyed that and Tom's previous full-length book, Goliath, which was a quirky retelling of the, the Bible story in which the uh, the great giant isn't always cracked up to be. Uh, Tom's art, especially in that one, it's so gorgeous and so spare. I, I just find myself staring at, at some of the panels and just trying to, to figure out how he does what he does and how he makes it look so easy. A Goliath is also from Drawn and Quarterly, as is a collection of Tom's literary comics, You're All Just Jealous of My Jetpack, uh, which is about genre fights of sorts. Um, he's a really fantastic cartoonist, and I, I love his stuff. And what's weird is that for someone whose work I've enjoyed for a couple of years now and uh, for whom I've, I've read several books, I knew nothing about him as a person, about his life. I'd never heard stories about him from my, my other cartooning pla pals. I guess it's you know partly because he's in the UK and not interacting regularly with some of the sordid cartoonists I know. Um, but either way, I did a little research beforehand as much as I could, uh, but it was fun to just sit down with him during the small press expo um, two weekends ago and just learn about his life and his art and... Um, and just how much reading he has to do to make all of those those literary jokes every week. Here's Tom's pretty sparse bio. Tom Gauld was born in 1976 and grew up in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, which I may have just mispronounced, but <laughs> sorry. Uh, he's a cartoonist and illustrator, and his work is regularly published in The Guardian, The New York Times, and New Scientist. His comic books, Moon Cop, Goliath, and You're All Just Jealous of My Jetpack, are published by Drawn and Quarterly. He lives in London with his family. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Tom Gauld. Hey, 
So tell me about the moon. Tell me what 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 led to Moon Cup. What brings you to the moon? Well, I I some of the first cartoons I drew when I was at college were about two astronauts bickering on the moon, and they were just looked like basic normal astronauts, but they were having very ordinary down to earth interactions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I've always been interested in space and sci-fi and things like that. But there was one particular book called Full Moon, which was a curate. Full, full. 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 Okay, just making sure. All right, that's, yes. Because Full Moon also sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, no, that would be good. That might be the title of the next one. You, yeah. You feel free to use that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and it was just a curated selection of photographs that the astronauts had taken on the moon. And they were just so beautiful and weird and empty and interesting i i really thought i wanted to do something um on the moon and i did a few short cartoons and thought i wanted to do something more with this but it took me more than 10 years to find a story that um i could put those feelings i had about the moon into can you characterize a little of that without telling anybody you know the extent of the book which i read yesterday i, I okay. got my copy from drawn and quarterly here at the show and and you know i, I adored it but oh, thank you um you talk a little about what 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 the moon means i guess well in the in the story um the idea is it's all set on a moon colony perhaps a little bit like the colony which might have happened after what we see in Stanley Kubrick's 2001. So maybe a kind of 60s or 70s optimistic idea of the future. Mm-hmm. And my story set maybe 20 years after a kind of wonderful blossoming of things on the moon, but it didn't quite happen. Yeah. And the main character is a policeman in that colony, but people have generally started moving back to Earth and have kind of come to the realisation that there's not a great deal to do on the moon. So it follows the policeman as the colony winds down and as he tries to find something yeah. to do with himself. And I love the the boomtown bust town vibe that that you know it's all it, it the good days are over or the optimism's long gone. It's a uh, yes, which I wouldn't say characterizes your your work overall, but there is that sense of of kind of that peeking behind the optimism, I guess. Yes, in, in your your other both the the panels and the the long form stuff that you do. Um, well, I quite like the funny thing is I quite like to draw quite epic, exciting things like um, for Goliath. You know, that's a biblical story, and I love doing all the kind of grandeur of the of the landscape. And with Moon Cop, I, I really love designing all the sci-fi stuff and, and drawing spaceships and moon buildings. But then when it comes to the narrative, I just can't seem to write in, in that world of grandeur. And things always come down to a more ordinary human level. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of embrace that now and think it's a kind of interesting way of... Um, of looking at those things like having goliath as essentially hr and an admin guy for the the philistines and yes yeah. yes <laughs> and with moon cop it, it, when i first wrote it, I, I was thinking i i kind of try and have more of a traditional story and maybe some exciting events happen but as time went on i just found i wasn't interested in putting those things into the story it's a moon there's a lost dog Yes, all comes back. <laughs> that's that's just about the most exciting moment. Um, and what yeah. were your influences growing up? Who were you reading? Uh, I mean, you mentioned the anthology, but what sort of books were you reading when you were uh, you were young? Well, both prose and comics. Yeah, uh, yeah. I start. But the first comics I read were the Asterix books, oh. Asterix and Tintin. I did um, a show with Anthea Bell, by the way, the the woman who translated most oh, of them. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a blast if you want to. Well, she's, yeah, she did an amazing job, didn't she, of translating those books? Yeah, we talk about how difficult it is translating jokes about 1950s French politicians in a way that even a contemporary British audience was going to get, much less one reading right. it decades later. So. Yeah, I think those that those kind of went over my head at the time. But um, the Asterix books and the Tintin books were the only comics they had in our local library, but they had a full set of both, so... I used to get taken to the library every week with my parents and would take out one or other or probably one of each. Mm-hmm. And so that was a big influence. And then as I got a bit older, I read a lot of 2000 AD, which is a weekly British sci-fi comic, which I guess has influenced my work. Which I think hit its 2000th 
issue recently. I, I think I remember seeing online that they were having some insane cover trying to jam in every Judge Dredd, you know, ancillary figure and, and right. all the other fig- uh, characters who showed up in that, that yes. anthology. So, um, besides Goliath, biblical fixation at all or is it just a great story uh because it's more of a popular story than than you know like chester brown going really in depth in his bible stuff no no i I think we were coming at it from different ways um (laughs) i would hope (laughs) (laughs) i no, i was i went to church a little when i was young but not seriously and i i wouldn't say my family are religious at all really but you can make a c of e joke around that but yeah go on (laughs) (laughs) um I, the, 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 the Goliath thing actually came out of a piece I did for Sammy Harkham's Kramer's Ergot 7, which was a huge anthology he did where each page was the size of a broadsheet newspaper. Yeah. And I, I said I'd do a, a, a story for him and I generally don't work very big and I thought if I'm going to make a comic strip which is worthy of these big pages, then it needs to be a big story in mm-hmm. some way. And somehow Noah's Ark just popped into my head and I thought it'd be funny to retell the story of Noah's Ark through the eyes of his son who just thinks he's a rather crazy um, old man. And actually, I have a brother and we have a dad who's kind of an inventor and a potter and always coming up with strange things. So it kind of came out of that. And I ended up doing a four-page, four-huge-page story about... Noah's Ark and I really enjoyed that idea of taking a story that people knew and that was kind of in the popular imagination and then reimagining it from another angle and and I also simultaneously had an idea that I wanted to do a comic with a giant in it I didn't know why I just thought maybe you know in comics you're kind of looking for symbols for your characters or a way that your character looks different from the other especially if you draw as simply as I do and I thought one of the characters being a giant would just be nice nicely visual on the page was there a sense of and and not to get into any sort of therapy vibe about it but that it was a way of breaking out of the constraints of the the regular work that you do for the guardian that's sort of constrained by the actual size of of a regular thing you thought i can go tall i can get these giant panels in and and have goliath walking by was there any degree of of wanting to break out of that uh well maybe not in the not in the panel size but that idea of having for for my graphic novels having more space to work with things is definitely something i like um with the cartoons i do for the guardian they are so small on the page that quite often i'll have an idea and I have to cut a lot of it off to to make it work in that small space. And sometimes that's good for it and it can result in a really tight cartoon. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I do feel I've missed out on telling a bit more of a story. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's what's great about working on things like moon copies. If I want to spend three pages silently moving the viewer around the moon colony, then I can do that. I don't need to cut to the point in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. Had the Guardian gig come about? Um, I, just after I graduated from college, I was looking for illustration work and I went to the Guardian and I had a portfolio, which was mainly illustrations, but I also had some of my early mini comics in there. And the art director of the time, Roger Browning, came out to, came out to see me when I went to collect my portfolio and said, I really love this work. And if I, if I can find a space, I'd I'd love to use you which a lot of people say yeah. and then never get in touch. And he got in touch a few weeks later with the odd little spot illustration. And then and then Posey Simmons, in fact, was doing a weekly strip for them. And she took a holiday. I can't have been a holiday because it was... Well, either she took a six or seven week holiday yeah. or had a hiatus for some reason. Mm-hmm. And I had to fill in for her. And I'd only been making comics for a couple of years. And... Posey is such an institution in yeah. Brit- in Britain, and especially in the pages of The Guardian. It was really terrifying to have to fill her shoes. Mm-hmm. And I did a series of comic strips, one-page comic strips, about great writers of the past. And every one of them had writer's block in one way or another. And the comic strip was about them not writing. <laughs> they were called The Writer at Work. And none of them ever got any work done. And I think it kind of came out of my 
t- terrified state of not knowing what to do to to fill this space every week. <laughs> And from yeah. from that, that led into the the more regular cartoons and and to the one that I now do every Saturday and have done for ten years now. And has Posey forgiven you? No. Um, <laughs> I I've never. No, no, she came back. Oh, good. She was she was fine about it. Yeah. I, I believe. Yeah. Okay, because you know she can hold a grudge. You know, okay. And, and wield a knife. Too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, you know, there's no knife wielding when we recorded ours. So, uh, about the well, the fact that it's a literary supplement that you're you're drawing mm-hmm. in. What's your your literary background? Because you do demonstrate more than a facile knowledge of of you know these these authors and you know essences of what they were doing. Admittedly, in a you know again, like you said, stripped down, yes. uh, comic mode. How much is that stuff baked in, and how much are you, you know, Wikipedia uh, uh, coming up with ideas and, and themes? Um, well, Wikipedia is great for fact checking, mm-hmm. and I don't want to make any kind of embarrassing howlers yeah. on um, on things. So it's it's good from that point of view. I mean, I've never studied. I I did English in high school, but I've I've never. I, I went to art school after that, and I've always read, but not. I think not to the level that people imagine having seen the cartoons. That's what I was wondering. Um, yeah. But as the years have gone on, it's, it's, it's introduced me to writers and it's, it's quite a, I guess, as time goes on, it, it, I've thought more and more about literature and, and, and about the writers that I might be making cartoons about. Mm-hmm. I, made, I think I made about three different cartoons about Jane Austen before I finally got actually around read and read it. a Jane Austen <laughs> novel. And then I thought, oh, this is really good. Yeah, I could actually do something with this. Yes. Is there ever that fear of having too much background or knowledge that keeps you from writing an easier joke? Well, this joke would be good, but it's really not fair because of, you know, in Sense and Sensibility, it's a broader blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, the thing I don't want to do is to make snobby cartoons that someone will read and think oh these are only for people who know Jane Eyre back yeah. to front and there is a there is an advantage to to not knowing to maybe not knowing the work in superb detail but to knowing the cultural idea of that work and mm-hmm. quite often my cartoons will more bounce off the kind of widely held idea of a of say Charles Dickens yeah. I don't want to get into specific jokes that only Dickens scholars yeah. are going to get. Although sometimes it's fun to slip in a kind of second level yeah. um, where people will um, get oh, that. Yeah, only the Martin Chuzzlewit fans will yes. really... Uh... <laughs> I did one cartoon which had a really bizarre reference to Ian M. Banks, who's a Scottish science fiction yeah. writer. Wasp Factory? Or is that a different Ian Banks? That it's the same Ian Banks, but he puts an M in the middle of his name when he's writing sci-fi novels. Yeah, And he writes these wonderful epic fun sci-fi novels and I, I i put some text hidden in one of the cartoons in the the made-up language from one of his <laughs> stories but I, nobody's got in touch to say they spotted it so I, I don't know i don't know if that worked yeah is the um was sci-fi more important to you than than you know literary fiction growing up um because you're all jealous of my jetpack yes uh, you know <laughs> well i suppose the two there was the 2000 ad sci-fi introduction and i i was just obsessed with star wars as a child so so that that kind of got me started you even born when star wars came out you lousy young people i <laughs> i no, was six I, years old I, so. okay yeah no i was i think return of the jedi came into cinemas when i was i was 76 so i was sort of seven yeah. or eight then but I, i'm sure it was on television i was seeing yeah. it but i had all the toys and yeah. and that the, the, those kind of introductions to sci-fi started me off and I, I i guess i read i still read sci-fi but sometimes and then sometimes not yeah more classical science fiction or or do you try and when you're reading that stuff do you try to keep up with anything contemporary um it's more i try and catch up on the classic stuff which i yeah. i think as a teenager i was quite lazy and i would read yeah. i'd read comics but i didn't read that many novels i mean i only read dune recently yeah um and I, I really, I, I've read. I really like some writers who, who kind of do stuff which might be sci-fi and might not be sci-fi, um, like uh, George Saunders' short stories. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. are really wonderful, and they they have that just just a little hint of a kind of science fiction world. And I really like Michelle Faber's book, um, the the Book of Strange New Things, which came out a year or so ago, which is a really amazing 
kind of sci. It is it's definitely a sci-fi novel, but it's but it's a very human. No, it's very human and it's it. beautifully yeah. written, and it's it's just it's very interesting. Where where did your drawing style develop? Which I know is an awfully personal question to ask, but it's such a distinctive visual thing. Your, right. your representations of people and and landscape. Mm. How'd you hit on that? Well. It's kind of how I always drew when I wasn't trying to make art. When I was a kid, I used to just draw all the time. And my school, my in primary school, my teacher said to me one day, you, you're doing so many drawings in the margins of your books. It's difficult to see what, what else is going on. <laughs> so she gave me another book, which I was allowed to have on the table all day long. And as long as I got the work done in my exercise book, I was allowed to draw in this sketchbook. <laughs> yeah. um, and the way I drew then is probably kind of the way I draw now. And yet I went to art school and tried to be angsty and painterly and, mm. and draw with charcoal and, and all these fascinating things. But in the end, when it came to saying things and telling stories, I just found the simpler way of drawing work for me better. Mm -hmm. And I guess from working on the tiny comics in The Guardian and maybe just a natural inclination towards minimalism, it kind of came from that. And I just I just feel weird putting too much in there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's it's very difficult to explain. It's just how I just... That's just the way it feels right to draw. Indeed. Cool. Did you see that coming out of um, particular cartoonists that you were looking at? Well, when I was in college, I discovered in the library of Edinburgh College of Art uh, a collection of Edward Gorey's cartoons. Yeah. Cartoons, illustrated books, picture stories. What, what Gorey did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was, a, that was a real light bulb moment for me kind of the way he drew I thought was wonderful and also the fact that he was making these stories which he didn't feel he had to follow all the conventions of comics mm -hmm. and could make weird but beautifully produced designed books which didn't didn't seem like they were following in anyone else's wake mm -hmm. um, so that really inspired me and even though now I've kind of come back to making more comic-y work it kind of came out of seeing the things that he was doing. So he was a big influence. You actually followed his path a little bit in terms of getting a New Yorker cover. Um, yes. How many yeah. actually have you done more than one? I know I've this. done two now. Okay. I remember Thanksgiving one. I, right. I can't recall um, another. But what was that process like? Did you remember pitching it? And did you... I've interviewed a bunch of New Yorker cartoonists and right. artists. And there's a certain thing about the first time you appear in that magazine that... that means something uh do, do you have any story from your your or yeah. you could say no it's no big deal you know? no no it was um i i think living in britain the new yorker i i don't think we realize quite the power it has yeah. um and it was the piece of work that more cartoonists and artists i know got in touch kind of saying, hey, well done. Hey, I saw yeah. that. It's wonderful. And then lots of friends in England who I hadn't realized were all quietly reading The New Yorker were kind of really amazed. Gotcha. Cool. So that was really lovely. Um, and it was quite a long process to get there. Francoise Mouly was so nice and, and got in touch and said, we'd love you to do something for us. And... A little bit like when I first got the job at The Guardian. It's just slightly terrifying yeah. thinking of all those amazing people who've worked for them and thinking, how will how will I do anything that's worthy of that? Um, and she's she's been really good at just encouraging me and accepting that I kind of um, get this kind of fear of working for yeah. them. I'm, I'm sure you're not the only person she's had that relationship with yes. you know i have a feeling there's a sense of uh, intimidation maybe. yeah uh, and a kind of as kind of a role of therapist to neurotic yeah. artist but uh in the end i've done two covers and a handful of illustrations and i've done occasional short cartoons for their website and yeah no it's it's lovely how many people see those things and and also that they've that somehow i've managed my my, my work has fitted in there without me having to 
do something I'm unhappy with. It, it, it mm-hmm. seems like there's occasionally I can figure out how to slot into that. Cool. Do you see a the way you've mentioned that the New Yorker doesn't have quite the cultural cachet there that it does in, in the U.S. Um, differences between British and American humor in terms of of you know how how you would work for one audience versus another, or mm. do you consider yourself essentially the Guardian is the primary source of your humor, and therefore that's the audience that you're that's a cultural audience that you're right. you're reaching to. Um, you know, I've never really um tailored my work to any audience mm-hmm. really other than just trying to make what i think is funny i mean that's hard enough yeah. to make to make something that i'm happy with let alone trying to think how someone else would find it mm-hmm. um do and you i la- think do, do you laugh over your ideas never okay i might i get i feel happy when i've when i've cracked it and when it's coming together yeah. but i I heard Dan Klaus say in an interview that he sits in his um, studio laughing at his own jokes. And I thought that's such a wonderful <laughs> idea and uh, um, lovely, but it's not its might, not how it is for me. It might be the difference between British and American humor. But anyway, maybe. go. go. <laughs> but I, I, th- I, think, I think maybe British and American humor are closer mm. than they used to be. I, yeah. I, I think maybe the internet and us all getting each other's culture much more easily has kind of brought brought us maybe slightly closer Mm -hmm. but also i think it's also a selling point that the work has this people say british humor to it or or just that it feels slightly different Mm -hmm. so uh, i think that that kind of works for me in a way yeah i I, it leaves me thinking of the difference between the british the the ricky gervais version of the office versus what we got in america which right apparently worked well over x number of seasons but doesn't quite have the acidity of of the the original no, no, it's, it's a different, yes, it's a different thing, I suppose. Yeah. I was also a Thick of It fan, and I, I don't think right. there's any way you can translate anything like that to America, but, you know. Right, yes. Uh, at least, except for the fact that I curse all the time at my day job, like, like <laughs> right. a, you know, Peter Capaldi. But but other than that, yeah, that's not really a, a thing that works. Um, can you talk a little about the, um, what you mentioned earlier, the difference in approach between, you know, working on the the Guardian pieces and then getting into the mindset to work on longer form mm. work? Well, it's a it's a big difference for me. And the, the the short cartoons, I do one every week for The Guardian. I also do one every week now for New Scientist magazine, mm-hmm. which is very similar, but it's about science. And both of those I do quite quickly. I spend about a day on it. And it's like a nice little ex- mental exercise every week. And I enjoy doing it. And if one of them one week feels like, oh, that's a bit of a weird one, or that one's maybe not one of the greatest cartoons I've ever made, I can kind of just forgive myself and then think, well, next week I'll make sure I do a good one. And you're saying the same thing about this episode. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and it, um, yeah, and 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 it feels like it's the aim in those is just to give a little moment of pleasure, have a little Mm -hmm. idea which sparks something off in someone. And it's, for me, that comes quite naturally and almost almost painlessly. Mm -hmm. But the longer books, I do find, I mean, I love the scope and I love the fact that it's my thing, you know, from the cover to the story and it's all contained in this object and it's all... I've 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 had lots of help from Drawn and Quarterly and the publishers, but yeah. I've I've we've made this whole thing, which is all mine and all one story. But getting myself to that point is is much more difficult. I find, I think, because I came out of illustration, I find the writing part is always slightly more difficult, hmm. or a lot more difficult yeah. than drawing. Um, so it's it it's it's a slow and occasionally painful process putting together the story for these longer stories. Have you thought of working in prose at all? Or are you really... Oh, God, no. That's what no. I was wondering. After that, it's really a, eh, no, no, I don't even want to write an introduction, you know? Uh, yeah, no, that is how I feel. I wouldn't know how to go about it at all. And one of the things I find most fascinating about comics is, you know, the idea that there are words and there are pictures, but the comics is is how you use those things on the page Mm -hmm. 
and that's the thing and that's the thing that I do love about making the longer stories is laying out the pages and and figuring out how to take this story and make it more by using the tools of comics yeah how did that process evolve for you uh, because it's it's an intuitive language in a sense mm. when you've grown up with comics from childhood onwards but there's a degree that once you're actually making it you realize you don't have to say this you don't necessarily have to include this in that moment it's a little different than than standard verbal storytelling uh, mm. in that respect where do you see that um no how, how did you evolve i guess how did you improve in the process we're going to assume that your work has actually improved i think okay. it had, but, <laughs> let's uh, do that yeah um yeah where did you what have you learned i guess in terms of how to tell a story well i mean i learned really by doing it mm-hmm. um i what did you do wrong early on i guess is a way of putting it and that you've figured out i don't need to do that or this or the other thing i can strip these things away well it was stripping things away but i, I one of the first, an, another early cartooning job was I had a weekly comic strip I did for Time Out magazine in London, which ran for a year. And that actually, I think that was about the same time as my illustrations for The Guardian. But that one was a real learning curve. I had to make a, a page of that comic every week. And I was kind of learning on the job. And I have very mixed feelings about the story that I ended up creating there. Um and i was i was kind of influ- at the time i was really influenced by chris ware's work and the way that he was making these the formal formal thing. fascinating pages which would have hundreds of panels and be be read in a very interesting way and i think some of that well no i'll go back what i mean is i think when you you can one can sometimes be over influenced by an artist mm-hmm. for a little while and then hopefully you move through that over influence and you take the the right part yeah. from that. I think where was a for guys older than you, uh, there mm. was a, a great degree to which Ware's arrival raised the bar for other cartoonists. Uh, it's my yes. thesis that Seth, without Ware, is a very different cartoonist. Once mm-hmm. Chris Ware arrives, Seth learns. I can loosen up and do these sketchbook comics, and I have to do other things now because there's this this I would say Mozart, but right, there's yeah. this you know genius figure on the horizon. Not that you ape that, but that you you know you get spurred on by something like that. So. Yes. Yeah. So so I I think there was a there was there was a while when I was um when my my com- anyway what i yeah. mean is i i've i've t- i've learned from his work and i i think it's wonderful and i've i've sort of moved on to um something which is more me and in a lot of ways it is simplifying and realizing that trying too hard isn't good and yeah. if you can, if if you can do if i can do it simply i like to i like to do it simply now mm-hmm. uh, and, and and then realizing that you know all even though i was so visually into Chris Ware's work there's also kind of at the same time this is when I was at college and uh Acme Novelty Library was coming out but also 8-Ball magazine was coming out and I was buying old copies of 8-Ball in the in the comic store and realizing that there's also this simpler way of um laying out things on the page and I don't mean simpler in a bad way but um but for those of for people who aren't cartooning people, uh, again, as you put it, there'll be a hundred panels to a page. There'll be an atemporal structure to it all where mm. the, the reader has to sort of actively participate in what the page is. That, that's a very different way of portraying something than a, a sequential narrative. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. As somebody who would never actually draw a comic of his own, okay. you know, I'm, I'm still down with, with where you're coming from. So, yeah, is there a. Um, is there something you want to do in comics that you feel you're not ready for yet? A sort of a, you know, if I get better at X, Y, or Z, you know, this is the, the thing that I would want to do? Um, I, I mean, uh, yes. No, no, not exactly, but I have... Um, I'd, I'd just like to get better at telling stories. I mean, the, the, the really short ones are fun, but i'd I'd like to do another graphic novel, and I'd maybe like it to be a little bit longer and to tell a different type of story so that is 
the plan. The next the next book I'd like to do, I, I have some vague ideas in my head, and I guess it's just trying to push my storytelling into things I haven't done before. And less cross-hatching, because it's it, it takes longer for every panel. Um. It does. <laughs> well, I, um, I, I did at one point consider cross-hatching every sky in Mooncop to a kind of very dark, almost yeah. black velvet. And then we would be getting to this podcast five years from now when you exactly. finally finished. So. <laughs> and, th- and then we, and then I just decided, no, I can't do that. And we need to use a color instead. And then now it's finished. I look and I'm, one of my favorite things about moon cop is, is the color we've chosen and the way it works on the page. So yeah. sometimes a, a shortcut can turn into a, yeah. a positive thing. Mm-hmm. I was contrasting it with Goliath and the, the degree of detail in, in the, the land itself as opposed to the sky. And it was just, okay, by, by the time we get to Moon Cop, things can be a little simpler uh, again. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, lo- I do love to have some cross-hatching on the page. I, I, in the, the drawings, I like to go simple and um, pared down, but I don't want it to be completely diagrammatic or mechanical so it's quite important for me that it's hand drawn and has just that little wobble of a kind of human input in there on the line Mm -hmm. and the cross hatching gives this tone which also has a kind of human warmth about it which i think i think is kind of important i wouldn't want it to get completely cold and diagrammatic nothing mechanical I guess. Mm. Yeah. Or a kind of mechan a kind of wonky mechanical, a yeah. kind of aiming for perfection and failing, which is to me kind of interesting. Like the broken machines in, in Moon Cop. That's, exactly. That's, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Uh, do you see yourself in a um scene? Is, is there a, a you know, sort of cohort of, of artists and cartoonists you, you either hang with or consider yourself thematically connected to? Um I mean I'm in a funny position in a way because when I when I first self-published comics with my friend Simon Lea in London, and this was 2001, it did feel like it was in a kind of lull of British comics, British indie, you say, indie yeah. literary, whatever you call yeah. what, what we do. Art. Art yeah. comics. Yeah, maybe. I know, I know. <laughs> anyway, whatever those yeah. things are, it was a quiet time. There wasn't nobody doing it, but there wasn't a lot. And that was great for us because it kind of coincided with the time that, as I was saying, Ware and Klaus were making these wonderful comics and felt like people were interested in comics in Britain and weren't and were understanding that comics weren't superheroes. And, you know, all those yeah. things that we all take kind of take for granted now. Um, and we were we were lucky that we there weren't hundreds of people doing it. And yet pe- lots of people seemed very interested in it. And a lot of my influences have been American cartoonists, North American cartoonists. So I'm sort of feel like I'm sort of in between. And because I'm in Britain, I also have a connection with France and they have a big comics festival that I go to there every year. So it it kind of, I feel like I'm kind of in between these three places. The thing is, almost every other cartoonist also feels like they don't fit in anywhere. So don't oh, don't okay. feel like you don't don't fit in because you're all part of a, a uprootedness yes. uh, vibe. I think. And it, it, there are cartoonists my own age. I mean, I'm I'm here at SPX and I saw Jeffrey Brown today, who's a similar age to me, and who I've met at some of these events as times times gone on. And he came to London and we hung out. And it's lovely that feeling of parallel careers with people, even if you don't see them for years at a time and do you have a uh, uh well beyond that the drawn and quarterly uh i don't want to say stable of artists mm. but you know is there any sort of connection just through having the same publisher that you feel yeah i mean i was so happy to be i'm so happy to be published by drawn and quarterly and i when i when i decided i wanted to do a book and that book became goliath but i just had an idea i wanted to do a longer story rather than self-publishing it was drawn in quarterly I wrote to and said, I'd really like to do a book for somebody. <laughs> Could I do one for you? And I thought having a publish a real publisher would spur me on to um, treat it like a job which had to be done rather yeah. than a kind of... Um... Yeah, the threat of legal action usually does help with, with productivity. I yes, <laughs> yes. But it, it didn't actually. They were so nice yeah. and so understanding that it took me ages to get Goliath together. But I was so happy to be with that gang of people yeah what was it that attracted you 
I know they've got a great publishing history, but can mm. you talk about some of what uh, what drew you to, to that company? Well, just the books, just, yeah. just the wonderful books they've published. I mean, I, I've always liked Seth's work and I'd see that from them and the... Who else did and and the drawn and quarterly anthologies which they oh god used the, to the original ones yeah yes. yeah and I'd buy those um, second hand or or in comic shops and th- those kind of influenced me and inspired me mm-hmm. and then when I joined them it's it's been great there are other cartoonists around the time my book was coming out Anders Nielsen's mm, sure. big questions was coming out and I, I'd known Anders before because we'd both been doing some self-publishing it's, he was self-publishing um big questions as pamphlets and i'd seen him at some festivals and tabled next to him so it was nice to have a friend with a book coming out at the same time as mine mm-hmm. even if his was 10 times the size. yeah it was a giant doorstop <laughs> yeah. of a <laughs> book yeah <laughs> but at least it wasn't as sad and depressing as as well it was differently sad and depressing from some of andrew's other other more personal work yes um, yes which we won't get into but you did the cover for the big drawn and quarterly 25th anniversary yes, book yes. um given that a lot of the people featured in that book are idols of yours um mm. and legends what did that mean for you that, that they and they asked you to do the cover well it I was think. kind of terrifying <laughs> and it is just that feeling of you know you've got all these people in this book who are totally, total geniuses. Mm -hmm. And now I have to do the packaging for this. I mean, the thing which did, which I told myself was because I spend maybe half my time drawing cartoons and the other half, I I kind of do illustration work and more commercial things. And I, and I do quite a lot of book covers and I did feel, okay, this is, I've done book covers before. I, I can, I can do this. Um, and I managed, I think, to persuade myself that it was an opportunity to to do something really nice rather than a kind of terrifying moment where everyone would... You they're know. looking at me and they're... Yeah, yeah, I could understand. And it's sort them. of... It was that thing they asked me to do the cover and then they said, oh, and we'd like some end papers which tie into it. Um, and that was fun because I could expand the, the, the kind of image on the cover into a kind of little story I had on my mind. And then they got back in touch and said, actually, would you mind drawing the spine for the, the, the book? And I hadn't, I hadn't quite realized that the spine is about three and a half inches yeah, wide. Yeah, it's a giant, it's giant book. Yeah. So that became another job in itself. And I, that was fun because I, I actually put a comic strip on the spine of the book. And that was a fun way to, 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 do some, to trick myself into doing something new and interesting. Yeah, how does the illustration the approach towards illustration work differ from your comics. Jaime Hernandez has talked a few times about how it's, it's just not for him. It's, it's not the inspiration of Mm. doing comics. It's, it's work and he puts everything he can into it, but it's somehow missing what the, the joy that he gets of drawing comics. Do you find that? Well, a lot of cartoonists say that. And I mean, a lot of cartoonists go even further and are are quite dismissive of illustration work or just a paycheck. Yeah. Yes. And and do, and do it it purely for the money. Whereas I really enjoy it, actually. I really yeah. enjoy the... It's a kind of freedom in a way. The constraints of it? The constraints mean? of it are freeing. And someone's already provided you with a kind of a text to set you off on this mm-hmm. journey. And it's, I, find it, I find it easier and in a way pleasanter. Yeah. to do than the comics hmm. it feels less may, maybe maybe because it's not just me doing it and i can there's a there's a lightness to if your thing is just to make an interesting picture um i kind of feel once i get into a comic i've got to tell a story it has to have meaning i have to have something to say with illustration it's it's more go, going back to that pleasure of drawing and and of putting images together to make an an interesting thing and I think I'd go crazy if I had to draw comics all the time I think I'd just I just don't feel I have a full-time career of things to say yeah. and yeah. illustration is is really enjoyable and I, I I think maybe illustration in England's a little different from in America in fact it is a little different because yeah. I work in both places and 
you tend not not with everyone but you tend in Britain to be left to do your own thing in illustration and some of my illustration work I've I've got I've put as much of myself into as in some of the comics I can I can really enjoy it so so I'm not one of those cartoonists who who hates doing it gotcha in fact, sometimes I think, well, it'd be easier if I just did the illustration all the time. Yeah, but then it's the, I need to express myself. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, are there things you've picked up from the illustration work that have helped in terms of comics? Besides just the, you know, the repetition of, of skill building, I mm. guess. Um, well, the skill building, I mean, it's the other way around. It's definitely helped. The, mm. the simplicity of comics, I think, has helped my illustration. The fact that you, that I have to draw things again and again to tell a story with them encourages someone lazy like me to to make them as simple as possible and that's definitely simplified my illustration and I think that means the illustrations are better at telling stories but the nice thing about illustration it can be being forced to put things in that I would generally write my way around in a comic yeah. if someone if someone says if, if there has to be an elephant in the illustration then I have to figure out how an elephant would look in my world. Yeah. Whereas maybe with the comic, I'd keep the elephant off screen and just have a trunk popping in or or write it out altogether. And I always forget the cartoonist this was about, but was in the 50s, I think, there was a Western uh, comic and the guy could not draw a horse to save his life. And right. it was always, oh, here he comes on his horse. A guy would say off panel and then the guy come walking onto the panel next, yes. uh, the next one because he just could not do it. So. Well, and that's interesting about comics that you, you have this thing of am I is it interesting that the things kept off screen because it can be yeah. or am I just hiding the fact that I really can't, I can't draw hands I can't draw. Yeah. <laughs> and, and your 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 weaknesses I think can be as important to a style as as the things that are that you're good at and can end up creating quite interesting solutions yeah, can you talk about that a little what, what are you bad at hands yeah it is yeah. hands because you yeah you tend to have ball hands yeah well little, it's got it's limbs got, coming off of them yeah that's yeah. definitely gone in uh there's a progression from my early comics where people had kind of horrible wobbly kind of rubber glove hands <laughs> yeah to i just haven't found a satisfying way of drawing a hand that feels right in my world so i've gone for this very simple just kind of ball shape mm -hmm. but i'm not it, it and it, it works fine in moon cop but I was thinking for the next story, I have some ideas. And it's like, oh, there's going to have to be some fingers in this story. If I... <laughs> and some of the things I want to do in there need fingers. So I need to I need to sit down with some old cartoonists and look at how different people. I mean, I think Hergé's hands are wonderful. Mm -hmm. I saw, I think it was maybe Sammy Harkham, who's a, a wonderful cartoonist, yeah. posted something on the Internet about how good Hergé's hands are. And I thought he's right. I should I should take a look at those because he has a lovely simple style and yet all the details are in there. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's when I get back from this, it's it's hand boot camp. Although you're here, you may as well hit up all the cartoonists that that you you love the the guys who are you know appearing here and ask uh, you get know, some, some hand advice. How did you figure this out? Yeah. Uh, speaking of, um, have you geeked out at any point over meeting cartoonists whose work you you idolized? Uh yeah, no, absolutely. And, and how bad? You know, well, have you been speechless around anybody? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm not. My, my kind of panic mode is, is silence. So yeah. I've never, I've never had a kind of horrible, over the top, yeah. shouting, screaming, hugging. I thing. love you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> but um, it's, it's just amazing to when you find yourself at something like this alongside people, especially the guys who aren't that much older, but who I was reading at that kind of late teen stage i think when whatever comics and music you you ingest kind of have this power then or at least they did for me which things don't now have that same i don't know i don't know how to describe it but the same power resonance yeah, yeah. things can impact you although uh, i will tell you in my 40s i have still had the experience of finishing a novel and thinking holy crap this thing changed my life like the, the, you may still have that that you know openness to, yes. to weird experience no and and, yeah. and and that's why i didn't entirely want to use the word power because I, I i it sounds like there's there's a lessening it was yeah, just a different yeah. thing yeah. 
Um, so when I I was at the Angoulême Comics Festival with Alvin Buenaventura, who was had published a mini comic by me, and we went out to dinner with Marjan Satrapi, Chris Ware, and Dan Klaus, and I was just kind of thinking, what the hell <laughs> I'm, am I'm I doing I'm shrinking under here? the table right yeah. now, just kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's also that lovely moment when you realize that people are just people, and yeah. um, we were all or, or, or all foreign people in a foreign country kind of hanging out, and it was it's it's nice when you i guess when you're all you all have this connection of making comics so it is a thing which makes meeting cartoonists fascinating is, is you you all know that you love this thing and you know what they do there, there's no shortcut they haven't figured something out that you don't know there's still a degree that you have to put the pen on paper yes. speaking of pen on paper pen on paper yes yes okay because, yeah, it's it's such a weird thing that people who tell me they're only uh, drawing on a computer now as opposed to, to paper. There's mm. no... Um, guys like Ben Catcher are now only computer. Yes, yeah. But it, there's no sort of like, oh, it's this type of comic that does that versus this type of comic that, that still uses paper. Um, but, no, he's yeah. a fascinating example of somebody moving to the computer, yeah. not because they've... Um, because they've always had computers and, and that's just there. It's, and it kind of makes sense for him. And I absolutely love Ben's work. Yeah. Um, but for me, I don't, I still like the pen on paper mm -hmm. and I just don't want to spend my whole day looking at a screen. Yeah. And also I kind of do feel that when the, for me, when the draw, once the drawing is scanned in and is behind the glass, of the computer screen it it's going away from me and i don't yeah. feel like i i have the same control i can fix things i can edit things but it's in a way it's fixed yeah. in a way that the stuff that's in front of me on a piece of paper is is not and it's it's in the stuff the the pen on paper is in my world and i'm in control of it and i, and I still like that I made one illustration entirely digitally because my scanner broke and I didn't have time to get a new one before the deadline. Yeah. And it was, it took a long time and I think it looks indistinguishable from my other work, but it wasn't an enjoyable experience to make. So yeah. I think at least for the moment I'm sticking with um, pen on paper. And what's your, your work routine like? Um, you mentioned having two weekly yes. spots plus whatever you're doing on, on, on the side. Yes. Uh, For a while I had three weekly spots because I did um, three small illustrations for the New York Times every week. Oh, yeah. But three three fixed things in a week just felt like I didn't have time to, to, to take in other things. So I've kind of gone down to just the two. Uh, I'm a morning person, so I like to get to the studio quite early. I get there about 8 or 8.30. And... The aim is always to get out paper, pencil, pen and draw and not get sucked into the world of the Internet and answering computer, answering emails and things like that. So my aim is always to try to, to get straight into doing some drawing. And whenever I do that, it's a good day. And whenever I don't, I, I just think, why did I why did I just turn things on and check those emails? Because it's. You know, the days got away from me. But you're not also a uh, uh, falling into the YouTube hole of, of watching video after video and, and not quite getting around to things? Uh, well, yeah, that, that's, that's the danger. It, that's how yeah. it gets even further? Okay, yes. yeah, yeah. Because that's um, the bane of everybody's produ uh, productivity, yeah. I guess. But the good thing about the fixed weekly deadlines for The Guardian and for New Scientist is on those days, it's very clear that what happens with the guardian is they 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 give me a theme for the cartoon so it has to relate it's on the letters page and it has to vaguely relate to the theme of the main letter hmm. it doesn't okay. need to completely address it but it it needs to come from the same world yeah um so this week it was um about advice for writers and um okay so yeah general theme so like it's that as general as that to, you know and yeah. and that's great because you know I don't have to think about what the cartoons... It's kind of... It cuts down 10 million ideas I yeah. don't need to think about so I can focus on this one thing. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just take my sketchbook and my pen and I'll sit and draw and note down ideas and think of things. 
And I generally also take a walk out to a cafe and have a coffee and keep drawing there because I find coffee and walking are the two things that fix your kindred spirit. Um, I, well, I, I, re I read there was a thing in The Guardian. In fact, they, a guy looked at all the writing advice from great writers through history and they had there's lots of outliers yeah. like Jack Kerouac and people like that who yeah, did Benzedrine, but you yes. know, still a stimulant. So. <laughs> yeah, but he, the guy who said it, said the 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 most common through line of successful um, help helpers for artists were walking and coffee, um, and it really does help. So, and and I think also just that that idea that things are you know, the visual stimulation is moving past you and and you're moving through it kind of sets my brain off and generally if I don't if I haven't cracked the idea on the way to the coffee shop then generally on the way back something's beginning to come mm -hmm. together you mentioned um let's see uh, working in partnership with someone and the mm. the illustration idea where they essentially give you what's there as well as the, the guardian thing where it's a theme have you thought of working with a writer at all has that been something that interests you as far it as making comics? It intrigues me. I have had vague conversations with writers about how fun it would be or not, or how not fun or how difficult. <laughs> how fun and they think it would be. Yeah. I think it's, it, 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 I think it might be interesting, but I think it would be quite difficult. I'm very used to, as I was talking of that idea of writing my way around problems. And for me, I, you know, that idea of editing the text to fit in with your pictures or editing the pictures to fit in with your text and, and the way those two interact is so fascinating that I guess I'd need a writer who was really up for a collaboration mm. rather than a, um, rather than being a bit given a script. Yeah. Although perhaps being given the script would be freeing in a different way. I, I quite like the idea of working with a dead writer who can't complain. Yeah, is there anyone you wanted to adapt that you, you think about? It's difficult because anything I really like, I sort of think, well, why adapt this? Yeah. I kind of feel, I was thinking maybe the interesting thing is to take something where there's something missing that you need to fill in, like a movie script or a play hmm. where um, you're, you as the cartoonist are, are, are giving that visual element. I mean, I do, lo I do love the play Macbeth. And I, I grew up in Scotland and uh, I remember when I was a kid, when I was at school, some of my friends were extras in uh, Mel Gibson's Macbeth film, which was shot in this amazing old castle on the hilltops near where I grew up. And I do like the idea of doing an adaptation of that, but it's, it's, it's tricky. And you wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do something like that unless it had some reason to exist and some something more than just another comics adaptation yeah it's like oh look a tom gold macbeth mm. yeah that's that's i think it would need one more step right. in some way or, or or some tom gold lego macbeth i'm just kidding <laughs> I, i'm the worst pitch guy in the world frankly i quite like this guy that could <laughs> yeah, work feel free to steal that then that, that, that's you. no problem at all um what did your folks think of of you, you went to art school were mm. they cool with the idea of cartooning or do they think this was not a and it, tell me if this is a horrible question to ask uh what your parents thought of your career or think of your career well now i have two children of my own who are yeah. eight and eleven and are having those funny child conversations about what they want to do when they grow up where mm. it can flip from veterinarian ballerina to princess to astronaut to, yeah i mean and it's fascinating but you you i am there is that thing where you're thinking, yeah, I suppose they are going to have to have a career of some sort. And because my my wife's an artist, I'm a cartoonist, lots of our friends are uh, cartoonists, writers and artists. I think they have this weird perception of the adult world where there's a very large amount of people making a living from, from art, mm -hmm. which is not how yeah. the world works. And I, when I'm when some of their friends, parents who were doctors and lawyers, and that this part of me wants to say, go and be, yeah. <laughs> go and be a play doctor. date with them, so you can. This is yeah. a terrible career. It's a yeah. terrible idea. But obviously, I can't. I'm not going to say that. But what, the reason I say that is because I, I do wonder, and I haven't talked to my parents about this. 
how how they really felt mm -hmm. because they were totally supportive um but terrified as you would be if your well, kids said i want to be a cartoonist yeah. i'll have to yeah. ask them yeah. i mean my my dad was an architect and my mum was a teacher so they he was in a creative world mm -hmm. and i think he had friends who were designers and he even had one friend who was a cartoonist so it wasn't for them a completely insane idea yeah but they i think they still cling more to the illustrator idea as the sensible career mm -hmm. compared to the cartoonist but they're they're incredibly supportive and incredibly proud of my cartooning yeah. although i think my mum would be incredibly proud of my serial killing if, if that's what i done i don't i don't know well he did end up in the newspaper that's good <laughs> yeah tom gall thanks so much for coming on the virtual memory show not at all thank you very much and that was tom gall his newest book is moon cop from Drawn and Quarterly. Uh, you should pick up his previous books like Goliath and You're All Just Jealous of My Jetpack, which are also from D&Q. Uh, you can find Tom's work every week at The Guardian and The New Scientist. And visit TomGauld.com to find more of his work. It's got a bibliography of some of his pre-Drawn and Quarterly stuff and blog entries and stuff that prints he's got for sale, etc. And that's T-O-M-G-A-U-L-D. Now, after the main conversation, I asked Tom, without warning, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his relatively surprised answer to that, uh, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can access our monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, patron only blog, series of ebooks that I'd love to launch if I can get up to a certain level of support, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine literary conversation. Now, this episode was recorded at the annual Small Press Expo in Bethesda, Maryland, which is one of the best comic shows of the year. You can find out more about SPX at spexpo.com, and that's S P X p o dot com uh, i tied this one into a business trip so parking and train fare were covered by my my job uh, but i paid the hotel bill out of pocket since um well whatever you don't need to hear all the explanations and the rationalizations and the ways that i'm somehow convinced that on my deathbed there will be an accounting of all my expense reports that would make for a pretty neat plot. But anyway, um, anyway, the hotel came out to about five seventy five for three nights. I did get in three podcasts while I was there, so that sort of pays for itself, I guess. Anyway, uh, if you want to help defray some of my costs, visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Paul W. Jones, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, which is used with permission from the artist. David has a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, the other David being David Ricketts. Uh, you can find out more about that, and you should really go get their first album, Welcome to the Boomtown, and support the reunion at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Haley Campbell, a BuzzFeed writer, um, daughter of one of my all-time favorite cartoonists, Eddie Campbell, and a six-foot-one boxer. Um, it's quite a conversation. We really had a good time. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. 
You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter at VMS Pod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtual memories show, and at virtual memories podcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. It'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Thank you.